All right, good afternoon, District 73, Ohio and beyond. I'm Kim McCarthy. I'm running to be the next state representative for District 73. I'm the Democratic candidate. The District of 73 includes the cities of Fairborn, Beaver Creek, Bellbrook, and Yellow Springs, as well as the townships that surround them. Um, once again, my Facebook Live is not working, so I'm recording this on Zoom and going to upload it. So quick update on the campaign. Um, things are going well, just we're into um, early voting. Um, I think I have three of these front porches to go before the election on November 3rd. So I hope you're out there educating yourself. There's a League of Women Voters guide that just came out. I have that on my campaign page on Facebook. Um, we put a mailer out this week talking about K-12 education and higher education. So I hope you got that. Again, it's on my Facebook page. Um, my opponent's been busy as well, not so much telling us what he's going to do, but telling people how bad a job I'm going to do. Really disingenuous to have gone the entire campaign without any sort of platform or talking about any of the issues, but when it, time, it comes time to vote, he's all about t saying what a bad person I'm going to be. And the claims are ridiculous. They're vague. Um, hopefully people can see through them. And frankly, I think that's a pretty good shot of me. Shows me how much gray I've got. So this photo was taken at the beginning of the year. My gray's really intensified. Getting old. Oh well, that's all I'm going to give to these silly smear mailers. No integrity in campaigning apparently. This is what Lambton did to his um, primary opponent by using outside money. He's doing the same thing to me using outside money of the Ohio Republican Party, which don't forget $1 million came from Larry Householder as part of that $60 million bribery scheme. So this is dirty money that's financing his campaign at the moment. Not good. This is why I'm running. So, so we don't have politicians like that. All right. Oh, there's a bee coming around to see me. All right. So um, again, with the campaign. We're having rallies Saturday afternoons. We're having lit drops Sunday afternoons. So if you want to get involved in these last few weeks, I welcome your help. Just send us an email, vote at kimmccarthyoh.com. All right, so I want to just have a quick, before I invite Dr. Doug Kozad on, I just want to go over the basis of what my campaign is about. So I've been talking all these years, it's literally been years, <laughs> a few years now, running twice, um, about investing in our communities. So in order to do that, we need revenue to invest in our communities. But unfortunately, the priority of the Ohio GOP over the last decade or more has been to cut revenue. Now, those cuts through have come in the form of tax cuts and loopholes. And those gains have been geared towards the ultra wealthy and corporations. So regular people like you and me, we have maybe benefited this much from it or not at all. Whereas the gains have been seen by those who don't need it. Six billion dollars a year is how much these cuts amount to. So if you add that over 10, 15 years, we're talking 60 billion dollars or more that we have left on the table. Those cuts have come under the guise of creating jobs, but jobs, new jobs have not appeared and new investment has not appeared. The numbers are in, the tax cuts did not work. It's called trickle down economics. You give all the money to the people at the top and then that will slowly trickle down to the rest of us. It has been categorically shown that that will not work and it has not worked here in Ohio. So in order to change that, we need to get some of that $6 billion a year back and start investing it into our communities. So the thing is, I like to um, talk about Australia and what I experienced growing up because Australia has a history of investing its money into the greater good into the community so that people can use that investment to create their own wealth. And I'd like to share a story about my parents who did that. So my parents came from working class families. My dad was one of five, my mom was one of three, but my dad and mom 
when they were, well, when I was probably 10 years old, they went out into business for themselves. My dad was a boiler maker by trade, a welder basically. And my mum was a bookkeeper. And they formed a structural steel company, which is basically a copy of the business that my dad worked for, um, erecting structural steel buildings um, for commercial purposes. So they had a long career, 25 years with that business. But when I look back at that decision, like how did people, how did they, people like them, how did they go out and create this wealth for themselves? Well, firstly, we had universal healthcare in Australia, still do. So they had no healthcare costs, zero. Their tax dollars went into providing healthcare for themselves and their family. They didn't have to worry about quitting a job to start this business and they were going to be losing their health care. They also didn't have to worry about saving for college. You know how much money people can put aside for saving for their children's college so that they don't have to come out with massive debt. My parents didn't have to do that. My college was paid for with taxpayer dollars. Thirdly, when they had their business, the Australian government paid my parents to have apprenticeships to train young people. They paid their wages so that they could learn a skill. Another way that they were helped. My parents bought what we call a housing commission house where the government built a house and loaned them the money for it. That was their first house. $20,000 they paid for it back in the 60s. And I remember as a young child going into the city hall to make the final payment on their house. Well, last time I looked that house, now of course it's had a few renovations over the years, that house is now selling, the last time it sold $750,000. <laughs> that, my parents used the investment in our communities to generate wealth for themselves. And Ohio is lacking in that. That's what we need to do. I, I attended the real estate, Greater Dayton Real Estate Investors Candidate Forum this week, and a lot of the questions that they asked of us were problems that could only be solved with government funding to address the issue. That funding would help solve the problem, would generate income for the investors, and help the renters at the same time. But we have no revenue in, in Ohio. When you pay your fair share, and that's all we're asking, we're not asking the wealthy and corporations to pay more than what we do, we're asking them to pay their fair share. We can use that money, use it collectively, where it can generate revenue or generate wealth for everyone. If you build your own library, what would it be like if every person built their own library? Think of the wasted money, it doesn't benefit the whole. What if we built our own roads to go places? We all had to build our own single road to go somewhere. It doesn't work that way. When we put money collectively together and build something for the good of all, it benefits everyone, whether you're wealthy, middle, in poverty, anywhere along that spectrum. And that's what we need here in Ohio. I've got this executive summary from One Ohio Now. The, these are the rankings of Ohio as we stand. Um, infant mortality, 41st in the nation. College tuition, 32nd in the nation. Poverty, 33rd in the nation. Um, hunger, 40th in the nation. Overdose deaths, 49th in the nation. Now this is 2018, and no doubt it's changed over the last two years, but we are failing as a state to keep up with everyone else. And it's because we're not investing in our public services, because we don't have the revenue, because we've given it away to the ultra wealthy and corporations. That has to change. And I'm going to be there at change. And a vote for Brian Lampton is a vote to keep things the same. That's all I got. All right, I'm going to bring in Doug. I'm going to have to tell him that it's not live. Hello, Doug. How are you? Great. How are you doing, Kim? <laughs> good, good, good. I just have to tell you, um, the live stream wouldn't work. I've had this happen a couple of times. It's technology, so I'm recording this, and I'll just okay. upload it to the page when we're done. Okay. No problem. So um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Doug Kozad. He's the superintendent of Bellbrook Sugar Creek Schools, my home district. 
And I just invited him on here today because obviously the funding of schools is something that's very important to me. Um, education should be a priority in our state. And you know, some communities are struggling because of the um, disinvestment by the state where they have to make up more and more of that balance. So Bellbrook's no exception. This is the third time we're trying to pass this levy. It's issue 21. And thanks for coming on, Doug, to talk about it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Of Glad course. To be yeah. Good. All right, so let's start off. Um, what kind of levy um, is on the ballot, this issue 21? Sure, so it's a 5.7 mil operating levy. So this money will be used for operating the school district. You know, a bond issue is something that would be used for building buildings, but this is an operating levy. So the day-to-day -day operations of the school district. Okay, and I've obviously followed all the cuts that have been made, and I guess we'll get into that, but you know, um, the auditor has been clear in saying that you are being good stewards of that money and there is no excess fat to trim after all the cuts we've been through. Um, so why, why are we on the ballot again? This is a kind of a regular thing, huh? Sure. So the, the reason why we're at, on the ballot again is because the need has not gone away. And so, you know, it's up to the school district to determine its need. Then it's up to the voters to determine if they're going to meet that need or not. And so, the way that uh, schools are funded in Ohio, especially a school district like Bellbrook, which has a high property wealth um, community, that we get a lot less funding from the state than other communities do. So not, nothing against the other communities. However, um, you know, we only receive about 27% of funding from the state and actually with the recent reductions from the state, so they came in and reduced us even more. So we were reduced over a million dollars from end of last fiscal year to this next fiscal year. So really it's, you know, it, it's, it's up to each community to decide what kind of schools that we have. And, and so it's up to this community to decide that, you know, the state is not at this point, um, really has not uh, stepped up to, to fund school districts fairly and equitably as they should be. Right, right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the um, reductions that you've had to make since the last two levies have failed. I know busing is one of them and my kids fall under that. And luckily they're doing at home this semester. So I haven't had to deal with it, but it's gonna be a problem for me come next year with my job and getting them there. Right, and, and again, the, the reductions are really disheartening. So we've had over $4.8 million in reductions. We have about a $30 million budget. So since 2018 through this school year, we've made $4.8 million reduction. So we actually have had five phases of reductions. And so those have involved uh, 33 staff members, 17 of which uh, were teachers. And these last reductions were the, the you know, through, through the first three or four phases, there's been five phases, even though there's only phase four, it's because the first phase didn't have a name because we didn't think there'd be additional phases. Okay. Um, so, but the phase four reductions, really until then, we really tried to do our best to keep it out of, keep the cuts out of the classrooms. Um, but this last phase, we, were, we just weren't able to do that. We cut, uh, reduced K to five STEM, K to five art, high school busing. We uh, uh, had other busing up to those two mile limits like state minimum. Uh, reduced a couple librarians, 85 supplementals, which are just not sports, so they're activities, clubs, advisors, those kind of things that really, as you think about it, you know, I know I can, when I can think about my high school and middle school career and so forth, a lot of times those clubs, those activities, those sports really, you know, give you that passion of what you want to do the rest of your life or, uh, you know, are able to to be for somebody, you know, that's the reason maybe why they're coming to school every day. They really love to do that play. They really love to do that particular class and so forth. So unfortunately yeah. those things have been reduced. Um, so now if the levy does pass in November, um, again, those phase four reductions will be coming back um, second semester, um, except sixth grade art that will come back next school year. But so those, those phase four reductions will all be coming back second semester if the levy doesn't does pass. Okay, well that's, that's one thing for sure. Um, and then what if it fails? So again, if it fails at this point, um, there's no additional immediate reductions, but really what it does, uh, it really heightens the, the uh, decision making of, you know, before 
know, we were really education first and then the finances second. But what it really does is it, it forces us to make every single decision based on finances and education second. And so obviously we've been good stewards of the money. We've been balancing those, but really it, it flips those to, you know, all those uh, extra programs or, or extra opportunities for their students. We just won't be able to explore those and have those going forward. Right, right. Hmm. All right. So, you know, I, I see a lot of complaints about um, the increases um, on our property taxes. Um, but I do know that we don't have um, any kind of a school income tax um, like other communities do. So how do, how do our taxes compare overall to surrounding districts or similar districts? Sure. So again, this information is in, in the bridge. It was in the bridge a couple of years ago. It's in the bridge. It's just coming out. Some people may have already received the bridge. Um, costs and you add up your real estate taxes, your income tax of, of city and for school. Some, some school districts do have a school income tax in our community, Bellbrook and Shrewsbury Township. There are no income taxes. Um, so, but when you add all three of those up, we're actually the lowest in the area per $100,000 house and per $50,000 income. Obviously, you know, the houses are, are more expensive than that in this uh, particular school district, in our school district. But when you compare apples to apples, $100,000, $50,000 income, you know, we're the lowest in the area, which I think surprises some people. Um, but when you really look at it per 100,000, if you took your same house and you put your $300,000 house in Oakwood, you'd be paying almost twice as much in taxes, or you put it somewhere else, you'd be paying more in taxes than you were, than you, than you are paying in Bellbrook Shirt Creek. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It always, it always feels like your taxes are high, right? But, um, yeah, you have to put it on, into uh, context. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I assume there's a website with levy information and, and um, a way to contact you with questions. I'm sure you've been inundated with them, huh? <laughs> sure. So, you know, there's a few ways that we're getting that information out. So on our website, um, on the top right hand side, there's a levy information tab. It has all the facts, all the information about the levy. It has a Q and A. It probably is uh, five, six, seven pages of Q and A of, of questions and answers about the, the levy and the issue, issue 21. But there's other, a couple other ways. So October 20, uh, I'm sorry, October 14th, and I want to get the date right, October 14th from 9 to 10 a.m. in the morning, and then October 27th from 6 to 7 in the evening, we're having tailgate talks, which during this COVID era, we used to have coffee with the superintendent. Now we have tailgate talk, which is an outside socially distanced um, event where you can come and ask questions about the, the levy. So that's an in-person opportunity. And then on October 21st, we have a virtual town hall meeting where uh, you can ask questions and we, we will answer those online also. So then you can also contact me, superintendent at bss.k12.oh.us or, or our treasurer, Kevin Liming. So there's multiple ways to find out the information that you need so that you can make an educated decision. Okay, great, great. All right, well, before I let you go, um, I just wanted to talk about how's school going um, with the new, under the new COVID situation. Uh, like I mentioned before, my kids are at home this semester, but from what I see, um, things seem to be going pretty well with the in-person uh, situation. Yeah, you know, things are going great. You know, um, you really find out that kids and staff members, but kids especially, uh, you know, the, the real unknown factor, they're really resilient. So they're, everybody's just taking this in stride, staff, uh, students, uh, yes, I have to wear a mask, you know, yes, I have to socially distance as much as possible, but we're still doing school, they're still having an enjoyable experience, it just looks a little different, feels a little different, um, but you know, they're learning a lot, and, and we are having a, a fantastic, fantastic school year. Also, those kids online, um, you know, we've, we've, uh, had a good experience with those students, you know, K to eight. We've uh, really switched around things a lot from the beginning uh, of school. That started about a month ago for our online students to now. Again, this is the first time that we really, in like other school districts, first time they really have taken on an online um, learning model on mass scale like this. So 
a lot of learning going on at the beginning there, but we had a growth mindset and looked at opportunities for growth. We had a lot of great feedback from parents and we've made a lot of changes to have the most positive student experience, whether you're online or whether you're in person. So, you know, it's a partnership between everybody to have a successful school year. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, I know my guys are looking forward to uh, going back in, in the new year. <laughs> they weren't very happy with me that I made them stay home. But, um, you know, if, if some of our kids didn't stay home, then it may not have been um, as successful. So hopefully right. this time sure. um, and the extra space, by the time we all get back together in January, uh, it'll all be good. So definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kozad. I appreciate you coming on and um, best of luck with the, yes, the rest of the year and the levy. All right. Thanks. Good luck to you too. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye now. Bye. All right. Well, thank you to Dr. Kozad. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, you found out some more info on what will happen with issue 21. If it passes, it fails. Um, personally, I'm in support of it. I can afford the extra taxes at this point, and um, I want to. I want to see our school succeed. Obviously, I'm fighting to change it at the state level. The state, in my opinion, well, factually, has neglected funding. 27%, as you heard him mention, is what he, what we can, or the state contributes to our school. And that burden is just too much for too many people. And with that being said, I respect every person who wants to say no on this vote. If you're on a fixed income, um, if you're a lower earning income or whatever reason you may have, um, you have the right to say no. And I understand that. Um, I just hope that our schools, not just here, but across our district and our state can get this issue sorted out. It's been decades now that the Supreme Court has ruled it unconstitutional to uh, fund our schools through our property taxes and nothing has been done. So the state has failed us and our children in that regard. So I'm running to go to Columbus and fix it. And what we know is we can't fix it without extra revenue. So bills like the Cup Patterson bill are not going to be successful because they haven't identified a revenue source. Unlike the federal government, the state cannot print money. They have to have a balanced budget. So in order to have more funding, we have to have more revenue. And there are plenty of sources that we have cut, that $6 billion a year I mentioned, um, where we can generate more revenue, especially in times of COVID where sales tax and income taxes are going to be down. We have to look to these other sources to fill that gap. All right, that's me for today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I appreciate you uh, tuning in and I'm sorry about the live stream issue again. Facebook, what's going on with you? But um, we'll see you next Friday and make sure you vote and vote wisely. Thanks. Have a great weekend.